Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Leo Ponomarev, and uh, I've been working in the web development space for the past 15 years, and I've been using Nginx for about nine of those years. So I'm also the writer of Enchan, which is an open source module for Nginx. What does it actually do? It is a buffering pub sub server for web clients. So uh, let me break that down uh, to explain what that means. So it's a pub sub server, which means it serves messages sent by publishers to subscribers over channels. It's, uh, it's buffering, which means um, messages that are sent from publishers can be received by subscribers, even though the subscriber wasn't around at the time. Uh, and it's designed primarily for web clients, which means it's very easy to use from web-based uh, environments, like a web browser or an application uh, on a mobile device, things of that nature. So it's got a really simple, really restful API. Um, you can publish very easily with plain HTTP requests. Uh, the configuration is very flexible. There's a variety of ways to store the messages. It can be stored in memory, uh, on disk, or in Redis. And that gives it a variety of scalability options. And I'll, I'll be getting to those a little later. But uh, first, a little bit of history. So. This originally started back in 2009, 2010, as uh, the Nginx HTTP push module. And I wrote this basically because I needed uh, a long polling server for some of my consulting work. And it worked pretty well, and uh, it did its job. I put it aside for a while, moved on to other things, came back to it. Uh, about two years ago, started adding features, refactoring, uh, renamed it to Nchan, because saying Nginx HTTP push module was uh, kind of a mouthful, which uh, brings us to today, which these days there are quite a lot of options available for uh, WebSocket type servers. So well, let's see what else is out there. Well, we've got Socket.io, uh, which is a Node.js framework. You, you guys are probably familiar with that. It's a, it's a way to basically build your own WebSocket server. And it has a fairly straightforward um, client that you need to use uh, on the web end. There's, a, there's Lightstreamer, which is a full-blown Java-based server. It's been a while, around for quite a while, and uh, it's proprietary, whereas Socket.io is open source. Uh, it's got a fairly complex session-based API that you need to use. Uh, there's also Fay, which um, is a Python-based uh, server, I believe, uh, and it has, a, it, it has its own messaging protocol. So there are plenty of others around, but the unifying um, thing about them is they all have some kind of intermediate layer be between uh, subscribing and uh, receiving the messages. So there's usually some kind of client in between that you have to run. This is one of the first ways that Enchant is actually different. So you don't need any kind of custom client to use to subscribe to Enchant messages. You just point WebSocket or event source to a subscriber URL and that's it, you're good to go. Uh, so there's a also a very simple API to subscribe to messages and to publish messages. It's as simple as a, a post request and uh, that's all you need to do to publish a message. The, um, along with a simple API, there's also a, a deep or a, a very uh, flexible configuration. So even though the API itself is straightforward, there is a lot you can actually do with it. And, uh, because there's a variety of storage methods, you also get a lot of different scalability options. So you might be wondering, uh, why is this thing an Nginx module? Why not just build out a server uh, by itself? Well, um, so you guys probably already know, Nginx, it's, it's asynchronous, it's fast, it handles open connections really well, it's non-blocking, uh, it handles uh, the, the, the memory footprint is really good on it, and uh, I mean, this is Nginx Conf. I don't think I need to convince you of that. Um, but the other thing that means is it's probably already your load balancer. And uh, here's why that matters. Load balancing open connections, not a great idea. And this is why. So let's say you have, let's say you have an Nginx load balancer, load balancing between two application servers. Uh, when the uh, HTTP client uh, connections come in, the load balancer passes it on pass them on to the applications and that's it. The number of open connections the load balancer has to maintain is just the number of incoming open connections plus maybe one for each application server. But when you're load balancing 
open connections like what you'd need to do for a WebSocket or event source or those sorts of things. Now, you need, now your load balancer needs to take in the open connection and then pass it back to your application. And on top of that, your application servers also need to be able to handle open connections. So that means you need to provision your entire network for handling, op for handling um, open connections and your load balancer need to be, needs to be doubly provisioned for handling open connections. That means more memory use, more CPU use, uh, slower load balancer. Uh, this is where Enchant comes in. Um, it reduces the, uh, what you saw in the previous slide back to uh, how a load balancer would work for plain old HTTP requests. So it handles WebSocket and VetSource and all of that stuff right at the load balancer. And your applications can sit there doing whatever your applications are supposed to do rather than worrying about handling open connections. So uh, like I said, uh, it has a very simple API and it's very configurable. And uh, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna uh, demonstrate that with sort of a basic example, and then I get, I'll get uh, a little fancier. So over here on the left I have a um, sort of a basic configuration. There's, a, there's a two locations there. There's a publisher and a subscriber location. They're uh, marked as the Enchant publisher and Enchant subscriber. And uh, these locations uh, all are um, publisher and subscriber endpoints to the channel tests. So channels are identified with uh, channel IDs. So let's, let's, uh, let's just see how this thing works. So I'm gonna send a WebSocket, uh, just uh, this is what you'd run uh, from your browser. I'm gonna send WebSocket to subscribe to the, the subscriber location. So it's, it's now subscribed to the uh, channel test and it's just gonna sit around waiting for a message. I'm not gonna keep it waiting too long. So I'm gonna send a post request to the publisher location, which will uh, get, which, uh, so the WebSocket will receive the message, and the um, publisher request will also get a little bit of uh, information about what's happening in the channel. So that's pretty much all you need to do to uh, get started with uh, using NChan. But uh, let me cover some things in a little more detail. So channels and channel IDs. Um, in the previous example, the channel ID was set to a static value, but of course, uh, you're gonna wanna set this to um, uh, some parts from the incoming request. So you can do that by setting the channel ID to any variable that Nginx exposes uh, in, in its configuration. So uh, in the um, top example, in the top location, I have the channel ID set from the uh, ID uh, query string parameter. Uh, in the second one, I have it set up to be the, um, uh, the client IP address. And on the last one, which is uh, my favorite, it's sort of the most uh, restful way to do it, um, I have it set to part of the uh, actual incoming URL by, uh, with a regular expression capture. All right, um, and uh, you're not limited to subscribing to just one channel. Um, you can have multiplex channels, which means a subscriber can subscribe to several um, channels over a single connection. And there are different ways to configure this. You can, set, you can uh, connect up to 255 channels. Uh, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here if you're interested about multiplexing, you can uh, read up on that. So publishers and uh, subscribers, what, what are they, how do they work, what are, what, are, what are the varieties of them? So as you already saw, we've got the uh, HTTP post request. It's the most straightforward way to publish a message. Uh, so you publish a message, you get a little bit of uh, metadata about what's happening in the channel, how many subscribers received the message, um, when was it last, uh, when was the last subscriber seen, those sorts of things. And uh, you can also send a get request to a publisher location to get that information without having to send a request. And you can also send a delete request, which does what you'd expect it to do, it deletes the channel and it kicks out the subscribers. And that's what I mean by having sort of a restful interface. Um, uh, okay, you can also publish messages with WebSocket. And it's as simple as pointing a WebSocket, so like in the browser, you just point a WebSocket to a publisher location and send a message through WebSocket and it'll also receive that uh, metadata. And that, by the way, uh, what you saw, the default is sort of a human readable format, but it can also be output as XML, as JSON or YAML, uh, so it does content negotiation. Uh, all right, subscribers. Uh, I guess um, the simplest one is event source probably. It's part of the HTML5 spec. Most modern browsers support it, except Internet Explorer. Um, but uh, to use it, uh, just uh, that's, that's how you'd use it in a web browser. Just 
point your event source uh, subscriber object to a subscriber location, to a subscriber URL, and that's it. It's receiving messages. Uh, to the right, I just have it, what it would look like over the wire, in case you're interested. Uh, okay, WebSocket, you can subscribe with WebSocket. Now, um, just as simple as using event source. Point your WebSocket to a subscriber location, and it's receiving messages. Um, there's also long polling, which is kind of the old school way of doing um, server push uh, notifications. And um, it, it's, uh, it requires just a little bit of work on the client side in that you need to mind the, uh, the highlighted uh, headers. So those are the uh, caching headers that you'll want to forward with the, with the next request in order to get uh, the, um, the next message. Um, so uh, now, like I said, you don't need to use any kind of client side library. To, to have the subscriber functionality. But if you want one, I do have one available. And it's basically a wrapper uh, around uh, WebSocket, event source, and long polling in case you, don't, in, in case you want um, things like a fallback, uh, automatic fallback. If one of those isn't available, it'll try to use another uh, type of subscriber. There's resumable connections. So if uh, a connection gets interrupted, it can be resumed later without, without having any messages being lost or repeat it. And there's some other features. Uh, this is basically the entire API for the front end subscriber.js. And don't worry too much about it. It's just, it fits on a single slide. It's, it's pretty simple. So there are also some other subscribers, which I'm not gonna get into too much detail except to say these are particularly useful for maybe IoT type environments or um, uh, I've seen people use these in uh, like uh, video game environments where you want to keep the parser overhead as low as possible. So it's primarily for web clients, but not only for web clients. All right, so uh, moving on to message buffering. Uh, so each channel gets its own message buffer. Uh, and that buffer is configured at the time messages are published. So over here I have a publisher location with uh, settings for the uh, maximum buffer length and the message timeout. So here I have the, the buffer will hold no more than 20 messages and messages older than five minutes will get uh, deleted right away. And by the way, just like with channel IDs, you can configure these uh, values dynamically from incoming requests based on whatever Nginx exposes as a variable. So from a query string or from a header if you want, lots of options here. Uh, another property, um, of the message buffer is, so by default, when subscribers subscribe to a channel, they start from the oldest message buffer, sorry, they start from the oldest message, and they walk their way through the buffer up until the most recent message available. But you can modify that behavior if you want. So over here, for example, I have it set to start from the fifth oldest message. You can start it from a, like a fifth newest message if you want by giving that a negative value. So you can also configure where your subscriber starts uh, in the buffer in any given channel. All right, uh, that's, that's messages, that's uh, buffering. Let's talk about the interface. How does, how does Enchan actually interface with your application? All right, so uh, probably the most common use case is when your uh, application is doing all the publishing. So let's say you have uh, an application that wants to broadcast notifications to subscribers, or maybe it's, um, it, it, it has a sing separate channels for each subscriber and it's pushing out uh, live updates. So it's very straightforward to do. You just send post requests from within your application to Enchan. But when you're doing this, you want to make sure that the publisher location is not accessible from the web. Um, and to do that, very straightforward, just with basic Nginx configuration, just put the publisher location uh, on a uh, local uh, IP address. So either on local host or a, a local network IP that's accessible only to, to the application. Okay, so let's say you actually want the publishers and subscribers to be coming in from the outside, but you wanna make sure they're authorized to publish and subscribe. Well, you can do that too with uh, upstream authentication. And uh, this works just like the um, auth request uh, Nginx module. So uh, if you're familiar with that, this, this will make sense. So what, uh, what this uh, feature does is when a publisher or subscriber uh, uh, sends a request to the a publisher or subscriber location, uh, Enchan will generate a GET request to your application. It'll forward um, uh, it, the incoming requests headers as well as some other headers uh, you can set in, uh, in, that con in the configuration. And uh, 
your application will then get to decide whether to authenticate the incoming request. So, for example, it can use the, um, the cookie headers to make sure a, um, a client's uh, session is authenticated. And if it's authenticated, it can respond with a 200 OK. If, it's, if it doesn't uh, allow authentication for, for some reason, if the, uh, I guess in that example, if the uh, session is invalid, the, your application just has to respond with a 403 forbidden. And then a publisher or subscriber re request will be kicked out or accepted based on your, uh, what your application essentially tells it to do. So, um, okay, uh, there, are other, there are other hooks for the application, but I'm gonna move on to, uh, to storage, sort of a this whirlwind tour. All right, so um, the default storage method is in shared memory. That's, a, that's a, a slab of shared memory that's available to all the uh, Nginx workers. And uh, the default setting for that is a maximum of 32 megabytes of memory. It's, it's good for development. That's not enough for production use, so you can configure how much memory uh, it's gonna take up at most. Where uh, things get interesting, pause on that, where things get interesting is um, if you want to start using Redis. Now, uh, how many of you are familiar with Redis here? Okay, all right, well, lots of people. Okay, so for those that aren't, um, Redis is basically a uh, key value data store on steroids. It's, uh, it's, got, it's got key value storage, it's got lists, it's got sets, sorted sets, um, hash tables, and it also runs Lua scripts. And I pretty much use all of that stuff to implement this, uh, this storage scheme. So um, all you need to do to enable it is uh, give it a, give Enchan a Redis URL and enable its use in the locations. And uh, different locations can, by the way, use different servers. Here I have them set up to use the same server. Now, what this gives you is subscriber scalability. So now because different Enchan instances can use the same data storage, you can scale out subscribers to multiple uh, you can run multiple instances of NGEN, which is running within NGINX, which I would recommend you run within your load balancer or some kind of other um, edge-facing uh, edge facing uh, server. And this basically scale out, scales out subscribers because it's all using the same data store. Uh, this doesn't, however, scale out publishers because all published messages have to hit a single server, which would become the bottleneck, which would become the single point of failure. So. For that, we have Redis cluster. Now, okay, a lot of you were familiar with Redis. How many are familiar with Redis clusters? Yeah, a lot less. So, um, Redis cluster is a, a fairly new feature um, in, in Redis. It's basically a, uh, a collection of, of Redis servers that uh, keeps itself, um, it, it basically shards out the uh, key space among different, uh, different servers. And it also does uh, like fallback and uh, other things like that. Uh, so uh, Nchan can use Redis cluster. And if, uh, if you guys aren't using cluster, which I'm guessing most of you aren't, this might be a pretty good use case to, to start. Now, uh, what you can do with Redis cluster is now you have, uh, you can still scale out uh, subscribers from, uh, for different uh, Nchan. Through, different, through the using different instances of NCHAN, but you can also scale up message publishing. And that's because um, different channels that are stored, uh, different uh, message buffers that are stored for different channels are gonna be handled by uh, different servers in uh, the Redis cluster. That means you can uh, publish, you can publish messages uh, to NCHAN, which will send them to the cluster and uh, different channels will be handled by different servers. So, uh, that's, that, that's how you get scale, basically, uh, both input and output. Uh, the other nice feature that you get is Redis cluster itself is a highly available system, so it has automatic failover. Um, it'll, if a server in Redis cluster goes down, um, a backup server will come in to take its place, and that gives this entire system uh, the property of high availability because there's no longer a single point of failure, and you also get um, you also get things like uh, failover from the use of Redis cluster. Now, um, Enchan is very careful about making sure no messages are lost if a connection to the cluster is interrupted. So if a cluster goes down, uh, Enchan is gonna, and uh, you, you're publishing messages through Enchan, 
it's going to buffer those messages until uh, a connection is restored. And it'll also try to catch up to any messages it might have missed. So um, there's a whole bunch of other features, I guess. We've got, uh, there's HTTP2 support out of the box. Uh, there is all kinds of workarounds for browser quirks and uh, uh, proxy quirks. That, that could probably be a talk on itself. Um, there's a stub status module. I'm sorry, there's a stub status uh, location, which is just like the uh, Nginx uh, stub status module, which gives information about the, the vitals of what's happening in, in NCHAN. It's uh, load, it's performance, um, those sorts of things. There's uh, access control support out of the box, upstream message passing, a whole bunch of other features you can uh, check it out. You can check out on the website. But um, fast forwarding through that because I want to get to some a little bit of architecture stuff. Now uh, I guess that might look a little bit of comp a little bit uh, complicated. So I'm gonna take it take it one step at a time. All right. So uh, let's say we have two um, workers, two nginx workers, and um, if you're running nchan here, so you'd have within each worker there's a memory store which is which has a hash table where the channels themselves are stored. Now the messages for each channel are stored in a slab of shared memory that I was mentioning earlier. And the, um, the, store, the, the memory store itself talks from within each worker to other workers with an inter-process uh, communications channel. That's just some shared Unix sockets within Nginx. Now um, the key uh, point about this basically is that Different channels, as you can probably see over here, the different channels um, are owned by different workers. Now, what that means is different workers are actually responsible for maintaining the message buffer for different channels. Uh, I guess to put this in a more, uh, t in a more uh, technical way, the uh, channel ID space is sharded between the, uh, the workers. And uh, the reason I do this is because um, the, because the messages are stored in shared memory, this helps avoid uh, m any uh, memory contention and uh, any uh, concurrency issues that might arise from using, um, from using data from different workers in shared memory. And this is a way to get around needing to have any locks. So uh, using this uh, sort of a sharded channel storage means uh, there, there are no locks on accessing messages, uh, all the processes are all the, the Nginx workers, that is, are always, they're always running, they're never, they're never blocked, they're always there to serve, uh, to serve requests. And um, I guess this is how it would uh, work if a subscriber uh, subscribes to a worker on, this, on the channel that it owns, it just, we would just get the message. Uh, if a subscriber subscribes to that channel, so a channel A, which would be owned by worker one, but it subscribes to worker two, the, um, the worker two will have to talk to worker one to get some uh, information, and then it'll send it over back to worker two, and that'll send it down to the subscribers. And I mean, it would work the same for uh, any other channel. Uh, okay, the um, Redis storage. All right, so uh, the way this works is there's a parallel storage engine within, um, within an Nginx worker with uh, hash table storing um, channels in parallel to the memory store. Um, but when a uh, channel is accessed in the memory store, it forwards that request to uh, Redis, uh, to Redis uh, with a Lua script. So pretty much all commands, all interactions that happen between NCHAN and, and Redis are done through Lua scripts, which are loaded to Redis at, uh, at initialization. And that, that'll create some uh, data in Redis itself and it'll also subscribe to a pub sub channel, a Redis pub sub channel, which will be used to, to send message notifications back to Nginx. And uh, um, the, the, the thing about this is that uh, when messages are published or um, when uh, messages are received from another Nchan instance through Redis, uh, sorry, through, yeah, yeah, through Redis, um, the uh, message gets forwarded into the, uh, Redis store gets forwarded into the memory store, and that creates a copy of the message in shared memory. So in essence, the uh, memory store in this configuration functions as a local cache to the data stored in Redis. This is why um, earlier, in the earlier slide you saw, uh, using just a single Redis server means you can scale out to multiple NGINE instances for subscribers, 
because the uh, messages themselves are going to be cached locally in each uh, NCHAN uh, instance. OK, so I guess that's a lot of um, back and forth, lots of uh, workers talking to other workers, uh, talking to Redis, uh, passing things around. So I guess you might wonder, is this thing actually fast? Well, um, according to my uh, test and the tests of a whole bunch of other people, yeah, it's pretty fast. So um, uh, on, uh, on my tests, uh, I can get about 300,000 WebSocket responses per second per channel. And uh, this is using some um, relatively old hardware. Uh, I have a couple of uh, decommissioned Facebook servers that I like to test this on because I, I, I wanted to test this on uh, bare metal. But with uh, like an Amazon large or X large uh, node, you might double or triple that number basically with modern hardware. And this, this number is only going to get better. It's only going to get faster because just because there's still a lot of tweaks left in the code. Right now it's fairly conservative and, uh, well, there's a lot of speed improvements left uh, available. So, um, all right. So that, that's sort of a tour of how you might use NCHAN and how you might configure it. Let me talk about how it scales. So. If you're, starting, if you're starting small, you're just a, I don't know, small startup, um, you're, uh, you're, um, if you want to send out uh, messages to subscribers, some kind of live notification system, all you need to do is put NCHAN in between your application and your subscribers. Uh, and because the API is very simple to use, um, there's very little development overhead on it. Um, now, uh, once your uh, small startup outgrows a single NCHAN instance, all you need to do is slap a Redis server in there, and now you can scale out to multiple subscribers, uh, to even more subscribers with uh, multiple Enchan instances. And once you outgrow that, well, uh, you can use a Redis cluster, and now you can scale out subscribe. You can scale out subscribers even farther, and you can scale out publishers. And uh, now you also have high availability. You have failover. The system is now resilient, and I mean, I guess you could keep growing from that. So um, yeah, uh, basically, uh, everything is really thoroughly documented at the website, which is enchan.slack.net. Um, all the, all the uh, configurations op configuration options, there's uh, examples for different things. Uh, if you want to uh, run this thing, I recommend you build it uh, as, a, as a module uh, yourself. You can build it as a static or as a dynamic module. That's up to you. Uh, I also have packages if you just want to give this thing a try for all the major distributions. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I've got Debian, Ubuntu, Arch Linux. There's a thing for Max. It's already in the, uh, in the BSD repo. And uh, it's, it's, it's bubbling its way up uh, in the Debian repo. So that's probably going to be around from uh, the sort of the main repository in Debian and Ubuntu probably in about a month. So uh, that, uh, that about does it. So um, again, the uh, site for it is nchen.slack.net. And um, if you're interested in how this might work within your infrastructure, or um, if, you're, if you're trying to figure out a sort of an Enchan-based solution, or if you just need some uh, developer manpower, I guess uh, I do have consulting services available. And uh, if you just have some, a couple of questions um, you can sh just shoot me an email or uh, ask a question on, on GitHub, and uh, I get to those pretty quickly. And uh, lastly, uh, if you're already using Enchan or you're interested or you like what you see, um, uh, you're more than welcome to support its development, and I do accept uh, contributions with uh, PayPal and Bitcoin. So um, that about does it for Enchan, and uh, thank you guys for coming to the stock. And um, I don't know, any questions? Okay, so uh, when a worker process gets lost, its uh, subscribers and the data available from that worker will also get lost, unless you're using, unless you're using Redis, in which case the new worker will just, if it's missing any messages, it'll just uh, send a request to Redis to fill up at the local message buffer. So, uh, but if, um, yeah, but if a worker disappears, essentially so will the data, unless you're using uh, Redis. 
Any other questions? I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite catch that. The posting? The uh, what? <laughs> oh yeah, uh, sure. That's uh, that's no problem. So um, you'd configure. Uh, uh, let me see if I can find this slide. No, I'm not going to find it. Um, yeah. So the, the um, one of the um, message buffer configurations is where you want to start in the message buffer. So if you want a first in first out queue, then um, basically. All, you're do, all you need to do is you're publishing to the, uh, to the channel, and by default, the subscriber will start with the oldest message, which was the first uh, message that was sent in. So that would be, by default, the uh, first in, first out queue. You can basically configure it to be first in, first out, or first in, last out. Yes? I'm sorry, you got to speak up. Across multiple instances, yeah. yes, yes. So uh, this uh, this configuration will apply. So when you're using uh, when you're using Redis, the um, the uh, message buffer configuration applies uh, essentially across the entire uh, the uh, entire system of multiple instances of Enchan talking to a Redis server. So if you publish with uh, if you publish um, from a publisher location from one uh, instance of Enchan with certain uh, message buffer, a certain message buffer configuration, that configuration will make its way to uh, basically all the other instances. It, it's, it's just going to get stored in the shared uh, Redis server. I don't know if that answers the question or not. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, any, any, any more? Anyone else? Uh, sure. So with the Redis, are, are you using the fast up for Redis? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so uh, Redis PubSub itself does not guarantee delivery. However, because the messages themselves are stored in a buffer, they're, they're, the data itself is stored. It's not, uh, it's not really lost. If, uh, the, um, uh, the reason that PubSub uh, directly from Redis doesn't guarantee delivery is because if a connection gets lost, uh, you're not going to be able to, uh, um, to retrieve the messages. Um, in a single, single server Redis mode, I don't really have that enabled right now. But in Redis cluster mode, yes, if a connection gets interrupted, um, of course, the pub sub connection to Redis would get interrupted. But once the uh, cluster or that server connection is restored, it'll try to catch up to the message buffer. So as long as the messages were buffered for the duration of time that uh, the connection was interrupted, yes, you have a guarantee of message delivery. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm sharing my worries. Uh, it would be to have a worker, worker for that real task uh, at the same time. So, how to work, work out the data? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. The shared memory? Well, share, share memory. And uh, maybe at the same time, have a worker for that, work mm -hmm. out the uh, shared memory. Uh, right. How do you work out the okay. Right, okay, I see. So, um, right, so as I said, I, do, I don't do any shared memory locking. There's, the only locking that happens is during uh, the, the, internally, the, the uh, shared memory allocator itself locks memory briefly while it uh, allocates and frees memory. Uh, the, um, the way that I'm handling it is by having different workers. Uh, okay, so there's, I guess there's two, two, parts, of, two parts of this. One is that, um, only one worker is responsible for actually modifying the shared memory uh, associated with a given channel. Um, uh, and uh, on top of that, there's, a, there's also a, a little bit of shared uh, memory, if I can just go back. Uh, let's see, where is this? Yeah, yeah over here. Yeah, so um, there's also some, uh, a little bit of um, uh, like channel counters, the number of subscribers, that sort of thing. That's, um, that's accessed by all the workers, and uh, that's modified by all the workers, but those are atomic values which are incremented uh, atomically. And um, 
Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that actually answers your question. Is that good? Right, okay, so basically, if you're running, if you're just running um, a single channel, then the uh, extra workers are only useful for handling subscribers. So where, where it gets really, where NChan gets uh, really scalable is when you have, when you're publishing to multiple channels, because multiple channels will be split over uh, different workers. But at any given channel is going to be, uh, the, the message buffer for any given channel is going to be updated by one worker. But those are basically, uh, those are things like uh, publishing messages, clearing expired messages from memory, that sort of thing. And uh, in, order, in order to keep them sort of, uh, uh, to get a little lower level, uh, I guess on a technical side, there's, um, like, there's reference counting for each, uh, for each worker to make sure uh, messages don't uh, expire too soon if they're still needed, uh, that sort of thing. Okay. Okay, yes. I don't use what? Threads. Oh, threads. Um, that's not really an option for uh, doing this from within Nginx. Uh, Nginx starts workers, and I need to deal with, work with those workers. Uh, fortunately, it already has um, a shared memory allocator that I basically hook into. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's essentially a limitation of working within the uh, Nginx uh, module structure. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay, uh, doesn't look like it. So, uh, all right, so um, I wanna thank you guys for uh, coming to this talk, and uh, I hope I added a pretty useful tool to your engine next